great pleasure for me to say that uh, for this closing panel, uh, we have been lucky that Margaret Macmillan, who is a professor at the Tufts University and uh, a well-known contributor to a, quite a range of issues, um, Margaret has worked. Mark Millen. <laughs> Mark Millen or Mark Millen? <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. Um, now, I think that most of us will have read the most recent papers of Margaret. They are well cited and they are deeply into the issues of transformation in uh, Africa. Margaret is joined by Kari Alanko. Uh, Kari is a Deputy Director General of the Department of Africa and Middle East of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, here in Helsinki. But Kari and I have one thing in common. Uh, we have two countries that we consider close to our heart because Kari has been the ambassador to Vietnam of Finland and he had actually also been the ambassador of Finland to Mozambique. So you can sort of see that there is some sort of correlation here. The um, third member of the panel is uh, Professor G uh, Gamano Mwabu, who is a professor of economics at the University of Nairobi. Um, for those of you who sort of don't know that, Gamano was actually the one who wrote the first invitation letter to the first wider annual lecture speaker, Douglas North. It's a while ago, but it just to say that Gamano has a long association with wider. Um, but he has also played a key role in the African Economic Research Consortium. <coughs> he has had a number of important tasks there, so I'm very grateful that Germano uh, is willing to join the panel this afternoon. The fourth panel member is Professor Tony Addison. I think most of you will know him as the Deputy Director and Chief Economist of WIDER. He actually was professor at the University of Manchester and uh, also a director of the Brooks World Poverty Institute. As a small personal comment, uh, you know, I'm sure, that Tony has been at WIDER before. Now, just before he joined WIDER in the first round, I made great efforts to recruit him to Copenhagen. <laughs> I did not succeed at the time. But I am exceedingly pleased that I managed to get Tony back to WIDER uh, in December of 2009. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Tony. And then last but not least, Professor Ravi Kanbur, professor from Cornell University. I already mentioned at the WIDER annual that Ravi is on our board. And I'm extremely pleased that, uh, Ravi, you have taken an active participation in this seminar, but also in all of the support that you are providing, all of the guidance, um, I appreciate that very, very much. And um, Ravi is the present president of Society for the Study of Economic Inequality and will be no stranger to any one of you, I'm sure. I've asked this panel to, in turn, give us a few reflections. We are not talking about long statements, but just sort of reflect a bit on the conference and the themes that we have identified to identify maybe a few key lessons. Um, is there something that stood out? And then maybe suggest some specific issues uh, for the future. But we're not talking about long statements. You should make them as short as you find it appropriate. And uh, then after that, we will basically get into an open discussion. There will be a possibility for you to ask questions to the panel, but also for just simply making, putting forward reflections that you find, hey, after these three days for some, two days for others, um, is there something that you thought you would like to bring to the attention of all of the participants here? But obviously, also for those who are then subsequently going to see the YouTube videos and so on. So this is a possibility for you to basically getting a message out which you may find important. So uh, with this, welcome to this final plenary. Um, I would like to um, start by asking Margaret to go first, and then Kari, and then uh, Germano, Tony, and then um, last Ravi. So I hope it's okay that we take it 
in these terms, and uh, I look forward to your comments and um, to the subsequent discussion. So, Margaret. Uh, thank you very much. I've learned quite a bit, and um, I'm going to be actually very brief. I, I think um, I think we have some some growing uh, consensus that there has been, on average, if that makes sense, some broad-based growth in Africa over the past decade. And I just want to I want to emphasize the fact that the findings in uh, Roderick and, Mac and Macmillan that structural change was growth reducing during the period 1990 to 2005 had very much to do with the fact that we took the entire uh, time frame 90 to 2005. Once we break up the period uh, 90 to 99, 2000 to 2010, as Alan Thomas and his colleagues did at the IMF as well, we find that in the latter decade, the structural change seems to be moving in the right direction. Um, in other words, um, people tend to be moving out of agriculture into sectors where they're earning more and consuming more. And I've checked this both with macro data and micro data using income data and consumption data. So the, the trend is pretty robust. Um, having said that, um, we don't have a very good understanding of why this is true. I, I speculate. Um, the 90s was uh, still a period of um, structural adjustment when, when countries uh, were still um, shedding workers from public enterprises and so forth, and that, um, that, that these uh, reforms have been consolidated and things are starting to move in the right direction. Um, at the same time, people seem to have more voice, um, but, um, I, I, and, uh, and, and, if you go, if you travel in Africa, you hear people excited, enthusiastic about uh, what's happening here at the conference. There are many people from different countries in Africa, and and there's a lot of enthusiasm about what's happening on the ground. And it, it, and I just wanted to mention that it, in my home institution at Tufts University, I have two colleagues uh, from Africa. One newly minted PhD out of Yale. She's from Kenya. And another uh, guy who has been with us for around uh, a, a bit longer, around 10 years, Ed Kutswadi, he's from Ghana. I mean, 20 years ago, that would have been unheard of. So there is a lot of change taking place. What I would like to emphasize um, that um, I've heard a lot in, over the years about gender and more recently about youth in Africa and the issues surrounding youth and the issues surrounding um, women. And, you hear these things, you think, is it a fad? You're not really sure. And I apologize to those of you who have been doing serious in-depth research on these issues previously. But when, when I look at the data, uh, I was able to look at the, the DHS data, and, you, and it's so uh, startling um, how much worse off in terms of at least being employed, for example, how much worse off women are and youth are. So I think that going forward, um, we need to do more to better understand why is it that youth seem to be um, disengaged and not uh, not in the labor force, especially in urban areas, and how is it that we can um, help women to be more actively engaged in, um, and, in, and even if they're only reporting that they're not employed because they're in activities that they are somehow ashamed of. So I, I'll leave it at that, and thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Kari? Thank you. Thank you, Finn. First of all, my excuse is that I'm not a researcher, so if I say some odd things, please bear in that, that in mind. I must say that I was really f fascinated by the whole seminar and, and the keynote addresses, other presentations and discussions. It was straight talk, mm -hmm. and even the numbers that, that were presented was really refreshing for a development policy administrator like myself. On Martin Ravalian's keynote address, the highlight for me was that, that we development policy practitioners and administrators often tend to see poverty reduction only in the context of development assistance or as something related to the relations between donors and recipients, if I may use that term. 
And therefore, I think his keynote really put things into perspective, at least for me, giving this 200-year perspective on how perceptions on, on, on poverty have changed. And Eric Torbeck's uh, keynote address on inclusive growth, <coughs> again, really deep analysis, which challenges many of the simplica simplifications on which at least we development policy practitioners often work on. And, and particularly his discussion on causalities and linkages between the growth, between growth, lower inequality, poverty reduction, what, in which direction the causalities function, that really at least gave a lot of things, things to think about for, 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 for myself. And these topics, growth, inequality, poverty reduction, are highly relevant, at least I think I would say to all donors, <coughs> including Finland, because among our development policy objectives, we have poverty reduction, inclusive growth reduction of inequalities, and quite often we are struggling with how to balance different aspects in approaching these things. And I think it has been proven by the discussions that the, there are complex issues involved, and there are, there are also choices to be made in trying to contribute to inclusive growth, and for us donors, talking about that from that pers perspective, <coughs> choices include, for instance, the following, whether we should focus on institutions or look more for the for impact on grassroots level, where should we channel our resources, should we work and through and with government structures, or should we put more emphasis on working with civil society organizations, should we focus on social sectors or productive sectors, how do we engage with the private sector? How much emphasis should be put on governance issues? What about democracy, human rights? <coughs> what about conditionality for our assistance? So these are all sorts of things that, that, that we are struggling with. And I think one thing that was important, from, which is obvious, is that the, the seminar has contributed to a deeper understanding of these issues. And at least for me, it was also com comforting to note that researchers do not seem always to agree with each other on, on everything, and that there are different ways of interpreting the data and, and, and findings. <coughs> Refreshing. And I think the role of research is extremely <coughs> important, again for us donors, in drawing general conclusions from research on what works and what, what doesn't. And, and also, I think research has a particular role in un, for us in, in, in understanding specific country situations better so that we can plan our policies and actions in a wiser way. And I think I would, two fun, maybe final conclusions that I would take away from this conference and, and discuss at our, at our ministry. How could we donors make more use of research in our work so that we can do our job better and how could research also play a more prominent role in informing the general public about the achievements and challenges related to inclusive growth in Africa? Thanks. Thank you, Kari. There was certainly nothing stupid in that. Kamanu. <laughs> Thank you. So I will follow my, my colleague and say that I'm a researcher, but I might say some only things. <laughs> um, so I want to highlight um, a few messages from the plenary sessions and also from one of the parallel uh, sessions. So I will, st I will start with the, the presentation by Professor Thopek. Uh, we learned from uh, Professor Topic that um, because of uh, better growth in Africa, uh, poverty has declined over the last uh, 10 years from around 58% uh, to 48%. This is the first time that we have, we have had the head count ratio going below the 50% mark. Uh, you also uh, uh, emphasized that uh, non-income poverty may may not have um, may, may not have 
may not have uh, found the same trend because um, although progress has been made on the growth front, in delivery of social services, especially education, health, water, and sanitation has been uh, problematic in, in Africa. So he called for better methods of delivering uh, these, these services. And in fact, if we look at the quality of these services, especially basic education, the quality has declined. And so non-income uh, non poverty may have increased because the, the quality of these services has, uh, has deteriorated. Uh, also on that note, I want to make a comment on uh, the observation that um, income poverty has declined. This is income, uh, this is a reduction according to the hand count measure, the hand count ratio measure. Now, um, actually I'm kind of embarrassed to say that, um, that although Professor Topic uh, developed these measures for us, in Kenya, applying, applying these me measures in Kenya in 1984. We haven't been using them. And in this conference, we have only used only one of them, the hand count ratio. There are two others. Okay, here is the, the poverty gap, which is the, the poverty inequality. Here is the, there is the, the poverty sever se severity or the poverty intensity. Now, the reason why I'm uncomfortable with the hand count ratio is because the best way to reduce poverty, the easiest way to reduce poverty is to get the income from the poorest group of the population and give that income to the people just below the poverty line. That way you quickly reduce, reduce po poverty, the hand count ratio uh, will come down. But of course, the, the, poorest, the poorest people will become worse off. So we would be saying on the basis of the, of the hand count ratio that we have made progress, when in fact we have made no progress. If we use these three measures uh, together, we will avoid that problem. So my plea here is that uh, in, in the future, we use these measures which uh, Professor Lopek took so much uh, pain to develop for us. Now, the, the, I, want to, I want to link uh, the presentation by Professor Lopek to Professor uh, Ravarion's uh, presentation, the first plenary paper. There, after a complex review of the, of the evolution of uh, poverty ideas, he said that in order to make, in order to reduce poverty, we, should, we need to do three things. We need to apply technology. We need knowledge. We also need voice. But uh, he did not say what kind of technology, what kind of knowledge, and how to actually develop these technologies. Actually, to say that we need technology to, to get out of poverty is obvious. What is not obvious is how to get this technology, how to get them developed. And this is what we should really focus on uh, 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 in Africa. And I want to extend is in determinants of uh, poverty reduction. Uh, from technology, knowledge. Now, knowledge here now should also include uh, not just skills and so on, but also uh, human capital in general, which Professor Bobek is saying that we should develop by, by, by uh, focusing on social protection programs, like in Brazil, okay, and in delivering quality services, especially to the poor. Now, I will turn to, to one of the parallel se uh, sessions. Uh, uh, which was on uh, the informal sector. And uh, there, two types of informal sectors were distinguished. The normal informal sector that we see more or less on a daily basis in Africa, where people are saying small things and so on, and also the informal waste matter sector. The informal waste matter sector. Uh, the sector where people, the very poor, uh, collect with the rudimentary technology, the waste matter from the industry, from households, and so on, uh, doing very hazardous work. And also, uh, uh, related to that one, um, it was highlighted that the informal settlements are also in that category. 
So if we actually look at Africa, what we find is uh, Africa is an, informal, is an informal economy, the whole of it. So in Kenya, for example, 80% of, uh, of, uh, of employment is the informal sector. And even in South Africa, where the informal sector was small, it's beginning to, if you've been visiting South Africa, you see that it's beginning to emerge, informalizing that economy. So the challenge now for, for Africa is not just to transform agriculture, but we must also transform the informal sector. We have to accept the fact that we, we, are, we, are, we have these um, garbage dumps where people, where people live, they manufacture things from these garbage dumps, and um, um, maybe we, need, we can't chase them away from there, but we have to find a way of transforming that way of a livelihood, uh, so that we have a livelihood that, is, uh, that promotes health, rather than the one that is hazardous to health, like, uh, like uh, the one that we see in the informal waste matter sector. And lastly, my comment is the one my colleague about uh, we, uh, gender, gender, gender equality. Uh, we need empowerment across uh, along the gender lines, especially the, the household sector. For most, uh, mo in most cases, the women are the ones who uh, run the homes, but they are also not empowered in decision making. So. Some might think, might think that's a small element, but it's very, very important. If there's no one running the home, the economy will not run. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Mwabu. Tony? Thank you very much, uh, Finn. I think the, uh, the things that really stood out for me were, uh, were data, the importance of measurement in relation to data, that was reinforced right across the conference. I think, I think data is, is sometimes seen as an overly technical issue. It's actually a real social issue, though, as well, because data allows you to construct a narrative about a way the society is going, and you want an accurate narrative about the way in which society is going. And if you don't have data, then it's possible for anybody, including the people who are most unlikely to advance the cause of the poor to tell their narrative about society. So, so data is not just a technical research issue, it's also a deeply political issue. And I think this conference has, has reinforced that and the need for enormous investment. And I think also the intellectual debate reinforces that because we're away from a world where in the 1980s, you know, we economists made assumptions about how structural adjustment would work. Well, if you believe the assumptions, you don't really need data to measure the impact because you know what the impact was. But unfortunately for the proponents of the sort of harder line of structural adjustment, the outcome differed quite considerably from what the assumptions would have predicted. So in a complex policy world, we need data and we need it not just as technocrats, but also we need it as politicians. Secondly, I think the conference has brought out for me the international dimension, but I think here also we as researchers need to think more about the international dimension. We, we've congratulated ourselves that there is growth in Africa. Um, policymakers in Africa congratulate themselves, and rightly so. But this is quite vulnerable to both the super cycle in commodity prices, but also to the very large decisions that are now being made about monetary policy in Washington and elsewhere, which we know from past experience can have major, major ramifications for the global economy. And we know that small African economies are vulnerable to shocks. They remain largely undiversified, and poor people within those economies remain vulnerable to large shocks. And we do not have yet enough buffering, either at the micro level through social protection or at the macro level through economic diversification, to cope with what may come over the horizon at us 
in a very unexpected way. So related to that, my third reflection is on the need to consider industrial policy to diversify economies. But we've already had a conference here at Wider in, in June about that, and I urge those of you who have not uh, yet looked at the conference website to look at the papers from that, because I think it really does help us to start thinking through some of the subtleties of economic policy making. Because the policy issues really are becoming, in some cases, subtle. As you move from a low-income country to a middle-income country, inevitably, for example, your financial sector grows and deepens. And policymakers want to know, well, you know, how can we advance inclusive growth by developing a better financial sector, a, a broader financial sector, a financial sector that reaches more people without blowing ourselves up in the way that the richer economies or some of the richer economies have done over the last few years. And that's not an easy policy issue to grapple with. That's a, a deep and complex issue about regulation and appropriate financial development. Policymakers are asking urgent questions about how they invest the natural resource windfalls that they have, both for the good times they have now, but also for the bad times that they may have to cope with later on. Now, those are all really big policy issues. And I think if we are to serve the need that Carrie identified to really use research to help policy making in Africa, but also to help the donor partners of African countries, then we need to have the ambition to go out and try and address and at least provide some answer to some of these very, very big questions. So I think I would urge a sense of ambition on all of us as researchers and obviously as policy makers. Finally, I'd like to, uh, to, to offer a personal reflection. I, I began my career in, uh, in, t in Tanzania uh, in the early 80s, in 1980, 81. Um, it was in an organization called Tumi Abai, which is the National Price Commission, which, was, which was, became one of the most hated institutions in Tanzania because it was trying to control the prices of uh, basic commodities, basic consumer goods in the context of, of hyperinflation. And, and as a young economist, it was uh, a real education experience in really how tough it is to do really good policy making in, in Africa. At the time, it was almost like being on a, a crashing aeroplane. Things were getting worse and worse day by day as Tanzanian policymakers try to cope with, with very, very large external shocks that were hitting them at the time. So my, my personal reflection is that here we are discussing inclusive growth in Africa. We're discussing some of the problems of success that we're seeing now in the region and some of the challenges as you move from a low income to a middle income country. And we should not underestimate what an achievement it has been to move that way in the last three decades. And that achievement has been an achievement of African governments foremost and African societies. It's been a big achievement of researchers, particularly through organizations like the Africa Economics Research Consortium. And I would submit it's had at least some help from the donor community both through technical assistance, budget support, and so forth, and the provision of global public goods. So without wanting us to uh, become overconfident, because I say, you know, you never know what is coming over the horizon at you, I think we should at least have some sense of congratulation that we've got this far over the recent period. Thank you, Tony. Ravi? Good. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Finn. Um, I want to focus on uh, uh, possible research directions and research areas, and I'll divide them into two, uh, conventional and perhaps less conventional. <clears throat> 
So I think there's a lot to be done in the, in the conventional analysis of uh, interlinkages between poverty, inequality, and growth, and we've had a lot of discussion of that in this uh, in this conference. And just because it's conventional doesn't mean that it's it's passé and we should now move on. I think a lot more work needs to be done on, done on that. In particular, for example, just to take a simple notion of the, the, the growth elasticity of poverty reduction, uh, its determinants, uh, what sectoral patterns are best, etc. There's a lot of discussion of that, but I feel there's still a lot more to be done and learned, particularly with new data sets that are, that are, that are, that are coming, uh, coming on stream. And particularly also bearing in mind, a uh, number of people have mentioned, that the data issues are really quite, quite significant. I was struck by Andy McKay's presentation in a panel <clears throat> where he pointed to the problems of, uh, uh, of data sources for monetary measures of poverty and actually he argued that the quality of data sources for non-monetary measures was better <laughs> in terms of comparability, consistency, etc., and not in some sense having to worry about price corrections and all of that sort of stuff. So I think that's, <clears throat> that's part of our normal science, so to speak, which uh, we, we as developed economics researchers do, and I think that's extremely important and we should continue. As another example, uh, the causality from inequality to growth. Again, a lot of work has been done on that, but I think we, we should be doing more on that, and particularly looking at the mechanisms of the, of the linkages. So that's sort of a, a whole conventional uh, aspect of it. Let me now turn to perhaps less conventional. Again, these are, all, these are all things that we're working on, so there's nothing new under the sun, but I thought perhaps we might emphasize some of these things in the future. Uh, one, <clears throat> one aspect that I want to emphasize is the group's dimension of inequality. Uh, much of the discussion in this conference and elsewhere is on the standard interpersonal uh, uh, perspective on inequality. Uh, the, uh, the Foster Greer Thorbeck measures, all of these things are sort of uh, interper focusing on interpersonal distribution of income. Um, whereas, uh, whereas I believe a lot of the, lot of the reality of inequalities in the, in the African context or elsewhere is group based uh, uh, differences in income. Uh, Maggie mentioned uh, the gender dimension, the youth dimension, but I'm also thinking of the, uh, <clears throat> of, the uh, of other salient divisions in society along ethnicity, uh, religion, and so on. Now, I haven't seen that many papers on that in this, in this conference. Is there a reason for that? And uh, uh, surely our data allows us to uh, uh, make inroads into that type of uh, analysis, that type of assessment. And it may be unspoken, but that's, those are the things that concern policymakers on the ground uh, as well. Um, uh, another type of example that I would say of, a slightly, of something that we've been working on but is less conventional is the implications of, for policy of the structural transformation uh, argument. We can put it in the context of rural versus urban, or we can put it in terms of broader structural transformation that Maggie mentioned, which is she said, from, uh, from the, the late 90s to now, if one looks at the data, that actually the transformation has been in the direction of higher productivity and so on. And for a shorthand, you can think of it as being a rural to urban, but you can think of it as industrial, whatever it is. So the policy question is, how much should you encourage, if, if you have $100 million to spend, <laughs> Should you spend it on raising the productivity of currently low productivity uh, uh, sectors, or should you spend it encouraging movement into uh, the high productivity sectors? Okay, uh, we tend to say both things. Okay, in our in, in conferences which focus on rural areas, we say you should spend more on rural development. In conferences focus on urban areas, of course, we should be spending. More. But I don't believe we have a framework in which we can answer the finance ministry question, <laughs> not the agriculture ministry question, not the urban development is a question, but how should re scarce resources be allocated between these two in order to have uh, a maximum poverty reduction? It also actually raises the question of what your objectives are. Is it poverty today versus perhaps a much faster reduction, a greater reduction in poverty tomorrow? And these are tough questions, and these are actually the policy and political questions that policymakers uh, are, are facing. So the reason why a policymaker may be investing in resources in a particular area <laughs> is not necessarily because he's unaware of or is stupid in terms of uh, the, the transformation issue, but for those sorts of reasons. And actually for those things, I don't, I don't believe we are giving sufficient help, analytical help to those policymakers. There are many, many other such questions. Let me end with a third one. There are many other things that I could, and maybe you can talk about it. Uh, let me uh, turn to an aspect of WIDA's uh, work program on sustainability and climate change. If we think about Africa, uh, if we think of the climate change issue as divided into two uh, concerns, the mitigation issue and the adaptation issue, I think by and large there's a consensus that in the African context essentially we're primarily into in, in the adaptation uh, uh, set of issues. Because in terms of emissions and so on, Africa is not a big player. 
uh, the, the mitigation versus adaptation issue is a China question. <laughs> not, uh, the mitigation issue is a China question, not an Africa question. But let me pose the following question. Would a reduction, would mitiga mit mitigation in China be good or bad for Africa? Because the concern about mitigation in Africa and India is that this will actually lead to a lower growth rates in these countries if, not, if it's not accompanied by appropriate compensation. Let's now feed through the consequences of, of, of mitigation efforts in China, which lower the growth rates in China, which then have an impact on, uh, on Africa. Okay. So should Africa be supporting uh, uh, mitigation efforts in China? Because it will have to deal with the adaptation consequences of uh, greenhouse gases 50 years down the, uh, down the road? Or should it be worried about it because the immediate impact of reduction in Chinese growth will be a reduction in all this growth that we've seen in Africa, which again many of us know uh, is related to, uh, at least uh, partly, to the commodity boom as a result of China, China and India's growth. So that's an unconventional type of question. Uh, uh, which I haven't seen discussed in this, in this, con in this conference, but perhaps we might think about uh, as we go ahead. There are many others, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Ravi. <clears throat> Thank you, Margaret, for pointing out that something is happening in Africa. Thank you for pointing out that we do need to pay attention to empowerment of women, and we need to focus on the youth. Thank you, Kari, for pointing to the need for productive collaboration between research and policy practitioners. Yamanu, you pointed to or gave us a warning about simplistic use of measures of poverty, the need to transform the informal sector. Tony, you used to control the price of beer, and now you're pointing to the need for data. I think that's absolutely appropriate. It does stand out, and it is clear that you're identifying the need for developing informed narratives can play an absolutely key role in policy making. Thank you, Ravi, for pointing to different research directions, both conventional and less conventional, and also for pointing out that there are big issues out there which we should not be afraid of asking. Development economics historically has never shied away, sometimes for some periods, but it is at the core of our profession to also dare ask the big questions. And I think that uh, was essentially what you were pointing to. So with these comments, basically, I'll now invite you, everybody here, to ask questions to the panel or reflect on how to ensure inclusive growth uh, in Africa. And we have sort of about 35, 40 minutes for that before I will be uh, concluding. So I think that there will be a chance for everybody to join in. Uh, but if you run out of steam, then of course I'll just basically conclude. I think I tend to start out there because it's sort of, you know, looking out the window is kind of nice. So I'm going to start over here this time. And may I add that it would be perfectly fine also within the panel uh, for you basically to engage if any one of you have comments to the other panel members, please do not shy away. I am down here on the floor for one very specific purpose, which is we'd like to have a conversation. Yeah, please. Yeah, um, Philip Baumgartner, University of Bonn. Um, thanks to the panel for the issues. and. Um, I have a comment, but it's also a question, so maybe you can react to it. It's, um, so my background is in agriculture economics, and I've been looking specifically at these large-scale investments, and I think the type, the way agriculture is done is changing with the globalization of the, of the food production system and big agribusiness are coming in um, and partly uh, going more into the value chain. Um, what if I combine that with, with what we heard in the last session today about industrial type of policies, what can governments do or what should they do um, to encourage these investments but also to seize uh, opportunities and, and not, um, yeah, to build on them? You want to react? Okay, we'll collect another. There was a hand over here. Yes. Thank you. My name is Hayford from Ghana, University of Ghana. 
I, of course, if you look at the development literature, and as we look in from this conference theme of inclusive growth in Africa, obviously one of the key things that we uh, talking about has to do with uh, agriculture and knowing how agrarian uh, poor societies in Africa are, I have been wondering why I haven't seen cooperative and organizations featuring in our discussion throughout this conference. And I know that in, in recent times it's been the focus or it's been the talk of, of, of the day where we know that once we empower cooperatives uh, at the local level, they're able to be empowered and certain decisions and it, it helps in eradi or reducing poverty levels. So if maybe some light could be shed on this and going forward what we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Here, Anna. Okay, we've been talking about structural transformation. I think this is a key issue if we want to <clears throat> substantially reduce poverty in the long run. I've been following the transformation of the Kenyan economy in terms of employment structures over the last 40 years. And the proportion of people in the formal sector employment is the same now as in the 1970s. So people are leaving agriculture, getting stuck in the informal sector. And what's driving this is that I also estimated the capital to labor ratio. And that peaked in 1980 has been going down since then. That means that people leave agriculture, they're stuck in low investment <coughs> sectors. So the key question to my mind is, how do we get investment up? What to bring about a substantial structural transformation that can long-term reduce poverty, investment has to go up. And we haven't really discussed this very much, which is the key question we started out in the first lesson in development economics with Lewis and everybody. Okay, thanks, Arne. We take one more here. Okay. Sopo. <coughs> Try to be succinct. Uh, being a researcher myself, I would uh, tend to agree with uh, Ravi's suggestion that there is indeed a place for uh, not only more unconventional, but possibly also somewhat more controversial research in uh, uh, areas such as the one that we're dealing with. Uh, more specifically, uh, this was something which Tony hinted at, the, the role of the global economy and of uh, uh, geopolitics in general in the inclusive growth, so here both inclusiveness and growth are relevant, of particular countries, uh, is not something that we can afford to be impatient about and dismiss out of hand. I, I think the weight of history is so much with us that it is uh, it is at least a little odd that such little attention is being paid to issues, as I mentioned earlier, of colonialism and war and international debt and, uh, uh, and aid. And, I, and, and when I talk about aid, I don't simply mean little finicky uh, 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 pieces of work which enter certain explicit bylanes on, on whether or not aid is effective at the margin but on larger issues of international redistribution, for instance. I think it is important for us, especially in the context of a, 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 a topic such as this, to deal with these. In the context of measurement, which also is uh, uh, very closely linked to uh, the theme of this conference, I think there is a great need for us now to start looking afresh at some of the various axioms in the measurement of inequality and poverty, which we have often tended to take for granted. And this is particularly true for the axioms, for instance, of symmetry and transfer, which is so much a staple of uh, 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 studies relating to interpersonal inequality, but which become casualties uh, when, 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 when we think of uh, group inequalities. And likewise, it is again a matter of some surprise that the question of how to measure inequality, of how inequality remains invariant, when there is a change in the size of the pie, is one which was addressed more than 40 years ago by people like Serge Christophe Combe, and yet we still stick only, almost exclusively in all our empirical work with relative measures of inequality, which probably accounts for our getting our diagnosis on what's been happening to inequality with growth completely wrong. And so these are some instances of areas in which we could both go back to under research topics and, and also uh, 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 take on work in more unconventional areas as uh, Ravi has suggested. 
Okay, I will now. Okay, assist. Okay. I will come back over here later, but now we sort of. Aziz from Wider. Uh, you have mentioned about informal economy, and we know that informal economy is not taxed and not included uh, in the GDP, while the 60% of the labor force and 40% of the GDP is generated. So the question would be, what kind of accurate measures you think we could think about, and uh, do you think that the further research is needed in, the, in this aspect? Okay, thank you, Asis. Uh, Carol? Uh, thank you. Um, Carol Newman, Trinity College, Dublin. I just wanted to um, echo Arna's comment in relation to the need to um, increase investment. And maybe this is um, coming from my background on the Learning to Compete project. Um, I would say it's not only investment that's needed, but um, responsible investment. Um, investment that links in with the private sector, um, helps, to, um, helps informal firms to formalize. Um, and I think I'd like to hear the panel's um, comments on that. Okay. Eric? Um, I, I think I should respond to uh, Germano uh, Moabu. Uh, uh, he had a, I think, very pertinent question, which is, uh, why do you always use just a headcount ratio? Uh, after all, you should know uh, about the poverty gap and uh, poverty uh, severity. Uh, and I think there's, there's one very good reason for this, which is that there is a uh, generally a very high correlation, not always, but generally a high correlation between the headcount ratio and uh, P1 and, and P2. Now, um, I, but I take your point and I definitely will try to uh, see if I can find any data on uh, uh, the poverty uh, severity uh, comparison, let's say, from 2000 on. My, my intuition tells me, and that's purely intuitive, my intuition tells me that the reduction in P2, in the poverty severity, would have been even higher than in the uh, headcount ratio, but that's, uh, that's speculation. Then I have a very quick uh, comment on uh, Arne Bixton's uh, question. Um, I, I slightly disagree with him. There is an excellent report that you must be familiar with, the, uh, the McKinsey report on uh, employment, uh, which just came out. And they use a large number of consultants. Uh, and they, it's true that the classification is not in terms of <clears throat> formal, informal employment. It's in terms of vulnerable and stable uh, employment. But what they do show is that in the countries that they selected, and I think it was a subsample of about 10 countries, uh, the uh, proportion of people in the vulnerable sector had actually come down. And even though uh, the uh, uh, difficulty of finding jobs for the new entrants into the labor force is enormous, there still has been some progress. Okay, thank you, Eric. Anybody else here? Okay, we'll move over here, up here in the front, and then we will move down. Thank you. Um, Susanna Brixio, African Development Bank. Um, I have a question for the panel on the inclusive growth. Uh, what do you think about the role of uh, regional integration for reaching inclusive growth? Because that's one of the key priorities of the African Development Bank, and also we see it as a way to reduce spatial inequality. But, uh, you know, it has its challenges. You have regions like East Africa that's growing quite rapidly, and then you have regions like Saku, where most countries are caught in middle-income traps. So how do you see that? And also maybe adding to inclusive growth. Also, even in small countries like Swaziland, you can have major in regional inequalities which are not related to ethnic diversity or religious diversity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then here in the middle, gentleman in the blue shirt. I'm Stephen from the University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And if we start with the, with the main theme of our workshop, that is inclusive growth. We all know that inclusive growth now is, uh, is like now replacing what we are used to call pro-poor growth. That is the kind of growth that is related with the poverty reduction. 
And over the last three days, the link between growth, inequality and poverty has been quite very well established in terms of the papers, the posters and the presentation. However, my, my concern was on the role of environment the role of environment in terms of environmental sustainability, environmental degradation, and especially natural resources. Because if we speak of inclusive growth in Africa, that means like a growth that is related with poverty reduction in Africa, we all know that Africa, for example, 80% depend on agriculture, and more or less same percentage depend on forests for, as the main source of energy. Now, if we are leaving out the issue of environment in all its aspects, like environmental sustainability, environmental degradation, and natural resources, I think we are leaving quite a linkage that would have completely changed the, the, the picture. And therefore, my, my suggestion is maybe for the, for the future workshop on inclusive growth, we should also try to look at the issue of environment and all its aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I will now ask the panel, uh, don't feel obliged, but those of you who wish to make comment, engage. Margaret? Um, so on the question of investment, I'd like to throw that question right back at you, Arnie, because how are we supposed to know what to do to improve investment? There's tons of research which is very boring because it's, it's been reiterated over and over and over again about the lack of infrastructure, credit constraints, all these things. I saw somebody once put it into a framework, which, it, which was, um, this is more about formal versus informal, which made a lot of sense to me. Like, I mean, the costs of becoming formal and so forth have to outweigh the benefits. So the government has to be providing enough services uh, that it's worthwhile for a company to show itself and and to invest for the future. I, I mean, there's a lot that can be done, but I don't think we can do very much about it. Uh, I mean, I don't know who you mean by we, right? But <laughs> so, um, so it's up to the Africans to decide that they want. This is what they want. And, and this also to the point, the question about the agribusiness in Africa. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something out loud, which I probably shouldn't say, but I heard a rumor, for example, that the, investment by the Chinese in the shoe industry in Ethiopia was, there were there are two people involved in that, that, responsible for that. One was Justin Lin <laughs> from the World Bank, and the other was Meles, is it Meles Zanawi, is that how you say his name? He's, he's not with us anymore, but I mean, the truth is, a few people can make a big difference. Uh, there are lots of examples of that, like Costa Rica, uh, and Intel. I mean, the president found out that Intel was considering, the president of po Costa Rica found out that Intel was considering investing in somewhere in Latin America. It had a list of top countries that it wanted to invest in. Somehow the president found out about that and decided that he wanted to go after that investment. And I don't know how he did it, but a lot has been written about that by, by people at Harvard Business School. But so that, and that's, and then, and then, um, well, uh, Regional integration, I, I think, is extremely important because market sizes in so many countries are small. So, but politically, obvious, obviously, it's very challenging. And then I just wanted to say something about what Ravi said. So, um, and to plug <laughs> a publication of ours. So, Ravi, you were at the conference we had in. Um, we had a conference about, I don't know, in Ghana on um, structural change in Africa. And James Thurlow, who just left wider to go back to IFPRI, and Paul Durosh had a paper in that, in the, in that, at that conference, and it's a, it's a special issue forthcoming in the world development about transformation in Africa. But their paper does exactly what you were asking. It, it compares the costs and benefits of investing in the rural areas versus the urban areas, and they use a computable general equilibrium model which I know a lot of people don't like. However, they do, I mean, they're able to quantify the costs and benefits. And I mean, I think the kinds of questions you're answering that a finance minister would ask, those are political questions, not really economics questions. And I, I think all we can do for a finance minister is lay out you know, different scenarios. And then they make the choices based on who their constituents are. But the, other than that, I don't think, that's my view anyway. Okay, Margaret, Ravi. 
Yeah, no, no, I would, I would, of course, I would agree with that. Uh, what I, that's beside what I was suggesting was that we should be presenting the finance minister with the with the options in this way, and uh, or rather, analysing the options that he or she would want us to, to look at. And I was suggesting we don't really have the framework. I'm, I'm familiar with the Thurlow uh, paper, and I think that's what we should be doing more of. Is, is what I was saying. Let me just take up the informality uh, issue, if you. Uh, yep. Um, please. <clears throat> So there's all sorts of things, I mean, uh, you know, about the definitions and so on and so forth. And, but I think uh, I'm one of those who, who sort of uh, uh, believe that actually informality is not coming down. Uh, I mean, as I said, there are lots and lots of different forms of definitions, but using conventional ILO type definitions and so on, I think the broad thrust, uh, there are differences and Brazil is different from other, but the broad thrust is that actually, as measured in standard ways, it is not coming down as a, as a fraction of the, of the workforce. And that's an interesting question for us because in Econ 101, in Development Economics 101, we're taught it will come down. In fact, we have a plot of uh, informality as a share of the, uh, share of the workforce uh, in the informal sector as a function of per capita GNP, and that goes down. Actually, there are two plots. One is that one, and the other one is the share of the population in the urban sector is going this way. And then our, we have our Lewis models and so on, which sort of support that. Of course, one of those things is one of those graphs, one of those things is happening. <laughs> we have urbanization happening. But the other one doesn't seem to be happening, and I think that's an interesting analytical conundrum for us as to why is it uh, that that's not that that's not um, happening. One answer is, of course, is the regulations. Obviously, you know, it's uh, it's the cost of becoming. That's why it's. Well, uh, uh, that uh, that may be true as a level effect. The question is, does that does that uh, give us any purchase on the time trends here? Uh, if anything, regulations, in, let's say, in the case of India, uh, have become less stringent over the last uh, uh, 20 years. And certainly the enforcement of those regulations become less, less, less stringent over the last 20 years. And yet, in India, for example, the share of informality has not, has not uh, declined. So that's an interesting question, as to, and a little question as to why that's happening. One thought that some of us have had is that may, maybe the nature of technology itself is changing. That maybe our mindset on formality versus informality is actually something that's stuck in, uh, in something 40 years ago, 50 years ago, where we think of the textile factory and the uh, 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 2,000 workers, etc., versus the small. Uh, whereas, in, I mean, and think, think in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, generator, of generators for power. If you wanted to be off the grid, you needed a, uh, your own generator. And 30 years ago, those were 40, even 20 years ago, they were incredibly costly. And in order to justify that, you have to, you have to spread that cost over a much larger scale. But now, you know, everybody can set up their own little thing. In the, so something is happening on the technology front in the last 20 years, which may suggest that the optimal size of firm has actually gone down, certainly in some areas. And maybe that's what we're seeing over the last 20 years. So, I mean, these are just uh, the, the speculative thoughts for us researchers to think about. But the phenomenon of the share of informality not declining uh, I think is, is uh, or even declining very, even if we say decline, declining very slowly, I think it's something which is both uh, an, an interesting research area and it worries the hell out of policymakers. Uh. They think, we were, to, we, we're told that actually a measure of development is that informality goes down and it's not going down. Uh, so what's going on? What should we be doing? Oh, okay, you tell me the regulation is the problem, so I'm going to think about it, but you tell me something else. So I think we need more uh, analysis and policymakers will welcome that. Okay. Come on. So, so on um, on um, regional integration, yeah, actually it will increase the market size. So that is good in one way for inclusive growth. But on the other hand, it can exclude because you see some uh, uh, people in some countries may not be able to compete. So the poor people there, although they were exporting before, may no longer be able to export. So in addition to having a, a, a regionally integrated area, you should, there should be a mechanism for redistribution or to help those areas which are lagging behind. In fact, this is what happened in the, in the 70s in, in, in East African community, uh, where the Tanzania and, the, and the Uganda felt that it is the Kenyan businesses that were using the infrastructure in their countries. And that will end up to the breakup of the East African community at that time. Okay, but um, uh, so there are two, those two signs to the, the regional integration. Now, uh, on the issue of the informal, in the informal sector, this is the most interesting aspect of African economies. 
uh, because if someone cannot survive in the rural areas or in the formal sector, somehow they can find a way of surviving in the land sector, the informal sector. And there, there is no regulation. Now, if you, if, you, if you regulate, then what do you do with the people there? Okay. If you say you cannot set up your small kiosk, so then what do people do? Okay. So actually, it's a very difficult problem to solve. And perhaps as, as people stay there, maybe there is a need for research to figure out the technology to, to, to transform that sector. And also the data is needed on the size of the sector. Uh, so thank you very much. Okay. Kari, are you okay? Tony? Yeah, I mean, one thing that might link all of these, these questions, and they are very good questions and comments, is, is actually the structure of public finances and also the, um, the generation of revenues. Because, you know, we know that without public revenues, we can't fund pu public investment. We know that out, without more revenue, we can't fund social protection. We can't fund better schemes of uh, regional integration or more investment in particularly agricultural technology to improve um, uh, African uh, productivity. And underlining this is, is, is the generation of revenues, the scooping up the revenues that are driven by the growth process, that are yielded by the growth process, then investing those through some satisfactory system of public finances, the formation of a it's been called a fiscal social contract, and then delivering you know, a much broader base of benefits for society as a whole. And obviously, this is crucially important in the more resource abundant countries. And you know, when people talk about the Nordic model, they often think about the welfare state in the Nordic countries. But actually, <laughs> a big part of the Nordic model is the actual success in generating a growth process which yields the revenue which actually then re yields the just redistributive mechanisms. In other words, having a very successful market economy supported by a state that yields those revenues for redistribution. Now, in that regard, we've, we've seen a lot of progress in, in Africa in, in the 30 years, at least. Um, if you look at, uh, again, uh, Tanzania, one reason Finn mentioned that I used to price, put a price on beer was that the beer factory was the only factory that was kept running at 100% of capacity utilization with the meager foreign exchange that Tanzania had because it yielded the beer tax. So the budget, aside from floating on, the, on aid money, was actually floating on the beer tax. But since, since then, fortunately, we've had the introduction of value-added tax systems, uh, a much greater awareness of, of the need to build domestic tax institutions, um, all of the nitty-gritty, rather boring stuff of, of tax policy management. Uh, and I think this is a, a really sort of crucial link and a kind of missing link in the conversation um, around inclusive government. Unfortunately, at the moment, the discussion around tax issues in Africa is getting a bit derailed by the sort of saying, well, you know, we should be cracking down on the multinationals and their, their nasty transfer pricing policies, which may or may not be true, but really taxation policy comes down to the sort of rather mundane matter of building a good property tax system, for example, building a good corporate tax system, moving quickly to an income tax system, eliminating tax exemptions. It's not necessarily things that get people marching down the street demanding, um, you know, more justice, but it is actually crucial to the formation of, of modern states. And, and that's really what we need to see much more of going forward. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, listening to the comments and reactions, so I, I can't help just maybe uh, to mention that in wider we have over the past two and a half years been, of course, working on, on our so-called triple crisis uh, work program. Uh, within that context, we've had a program on, on, on foreign aid, and I'd, I'd like to sort of mention that while that program has had an element of foreign aid, we've actually used that as a way to be digging into issues of growth and employment, of social sectors, of gender, and of environment and climate change. 
And we are in the process of putting out a number of so-called position papers, and certainly some of the issues that have been touched upon here are quite central to some of these uh, position papers. So I'd like, and also, sorry, I should also mention the fragility and governance. So I mean, those of you who sort of are thinking, well, while, while, while the heading there is aid and something, I would like to encourage you to just, just, just sort of browse through because you will find a lot more in there on these various dimensions. And there was at least one question <clears throat> on environment and climate change where I think uh, that take a look at our position paper there. It might actually be quite useful because we have been trying to synthesize what we believe that you can say when you're now looking to this area. I'll move over here now and just ask. Yeah, okay. Succinct, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Abdul Gafaro and I'm from Ghana. Uh, my intervention relates directly to um, the theme of this panel, uh, which is how to promote inclusive growth in Africa. And I guess uh, we will probably need to have very clear answers to a number of why questions if we are to be able to address this question, um, this how question more effectively. I mean, in the last session before this panel, uh, we heard of an emerging Brazilian model of development and how and whether African countries can learn some lessons from this particular model. But we understood from uh, the presenters as well that the emergence of this model was facilitated particularly by um, a strong inter-party national consensus as to how to enhance development in Brazil. I mean, the question that came to my mind when I heard this is, why have Brazilian political entrepreneurs been able to foster such a consensus? Whereas in Ghana, every single political party that comes to power is very quick in discrediting and discarding um, the development plans of his um, predecessor. So I mean, the, the bottom line of my point is, in thinking of how to promote inclusive growth in Africa, we cannot and should not gloss over the unique characteristics of the African state and African politics. Okay, thank you. Anybody else here? Okay, there are two here. Um, we start here in the front and then Denise afterwards. Hi, Riza Daniels from the University of Cape Town. I'd like um, just the panel to reflect on two issues, which one is the role of indigenous knowledge systems inside of Africa and how they can be leveraged potentially. Um, to uh, assist the development process. The second is uh, in the presence of non-market land tenure, um, where you have the existence frequently of both a uh, market tenure reform, uh, market tenure system for land, coexisting with a tribal form of tenure. This is, exists across Africa in many different countries. And my question is just how this, uh, how we go about dealing with these issues uh, in the process. Okay, thank you. Dennis? Uh, Denis Cognot from Paris School of Economics. I, I wanted to, to raise three remarks and to ask a question. So first remark, uh, there is, if only because of the growth of China, of the Chinese economy, at this very moment a rush on mineral resources uh, uh, that uh, in, you know, on, uh, of the continent, uh, so not only oil but also uh, m many other m mineral products. Uh, even countries that were not formerly oil exporters are, t are turning into uh, oil exporters. If only Ghana, but also Cote d'Ivoire, and so and, and there are many other examples. And 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 so. Part of the growth that we observe is also driven by the growth of the prices of the, these raw materials, the growth of the output, the associated investments in infrastructure in particular, or even expenditures in insurance that are associated with the exports of those raw materials. My second remark is that we still lack a bit of, uh, well, with some exceptions, the evidence on the intensification of agricultural practices is still fragile. Uh, and so, so, and, and it's not completely obvious that technology adoption is, uh, is high. And even 
that uh, there are the useful technologies that are really uh, 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 meaningful for, for, for African peasants are available, actually, in many sectors, in many subsectors of agriculture. Uh, the, third, the third remark is that, as we have seen in some presentations, uh, there are uh, we, some countries who, who experience great, great, great growth uh, at, this, at this very moment are still recovering from past shocks, whether they are of, of political, uh, 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 you know, whether they are political, of the, whether they were uh, macroeconomic. So there is a process also, also of recovery, of mean reversion, so that part of this growth could not be per perhaps sustainable. So, my, so after having done these three remarks, I wouldn't like to be to be seen as the bird of <laughs> of, of of despair but but uh, but uh, but just i'm just uh, asking when we th we think of inclusive growth and thinking of in particular of this rush towards mineral resources uh, it would be in interesting to hear the panel about about how to make this the, this rents extracting uh, extracted uh, uh, from from minerals uh, more in, uh, more inclusive than in the past. Okay, Eric, you had a two-handed intervention. Uh, wait, wait, wait! You just need the mic. Um, I, I okay. was going to raise a, uh, a related issue. Um, I couldn't clone myself, so of course I was limited to certain sessions, and uh, it may very well have been that. Uh, uh, this, what I'm going to bring up, has been discussed, but I heard very little uh, about the whole issue of uh, land grabbing, about the whole issue of uh, uh, investment uh, into uh, natural resources. Um, and it seems to me that uh, uh, it's not at all inconceivable that uh, in the short run, uh, this is going to bring a flow of foreign direct investment that is going to accelerate the, uh, the growth, but the consequences in the medium and long run could really work strongly against inclusivity. Uh, now, I'm just raising this as a question, and maybe it has been discussed, but if it hasn't, I think it's something we ought to keep in mind. Okay, you may not be able to clone yourself, but you have some people who want to sort of at least be somewhat approaching you in terms of asking pointed questions. Anybody else here? In the back, Surab? I am okay. uh, Saurabh at uh, wider. So we unfortunately did not hear too much about uh, conflict issues in uh, this conference. So uh, one uh, emerging uh, result is that uh, conflict leads to strengthening uh, along uh, of uh, ethnic networks and and in the uh, presence of such uh, effects uh, how does one promote uh, inclusive growth once you recover from uh, conflict mm -hmm. okay Rachel hi uh, Rachel Gizelquist also from you and you wider um, and building on the, the previous comment I think um, in reflecting on the overall lessons of the conference I think it would also be interesting to um, keep to be sure to keep on the table and to highlight issues, political issues, um, and, and the role of, of citizen participation, of voting, of civil society participation, and so on, um, in creating inclusive great growth and in demanding inclusive growth, um, in supporting or not political leaders that that provide for inclusive growth. Um, I think these are issues we need to tease out a bit more. We had some interesting interesting panels on these topics, but I wanted to highlight that. In, in my comments. Okay, point taken, that's for sure. Okay, here. I was gr glad that the uh, point was made about urbanization. I think I just want to expand a bit on that and the significance of it. Africa is going to double its urban population in the next 20 years or so. So I think it's critically important uh, both to prevent um, conflict disasters of various kinds and also longer term planning ahead, I think, that, that we try and get this right. And I think that must be, urbanization must be a, a key part of this inclusive growth agenda, getting out the structure and organization of our settlements better. It links a number of points about the environment, doing it in a way that, you know, is less energy intensive, less resource intensive. It also links with, with Tony's point about tax collection. If we do organize our settlements effectively, improves, you know, ability to raise property taxes. Um, 
and doing it, of course, in a way that will uh, facilitate economic development, I think, is critically important. So that urban agenda, I think, must be critical to the whole uh, inclusive growth agenda. Thank you. Anybody here? Okay. Over here. Thanks, Finn. Um, Amelia Santos from UNCTAD. I just want to make a general comment about how timely this conference was, especially when I look at the report of the high panel to the post-2015 development framework. And if I pick up the five priority areas for, for Africa, basically we have been discussing them today. Leave no one behind, basically inclusive, if inclusiveness, sustainable development at the core, transfer economic jobs for inclusive growth, build peace and effective and open accountable institutions for all, and finally, a new global partnership. So I think we have been successful in discussing issues that we are going to be working on for the next 15 years. So now how we try to translate these priority areas into, into research, I think is, is very important. Particularly the last part that has to do with the exogenous nature of globalization, as Eric presented, but also the endogenous nature of what countries need to do to translate trade policy and other policy areas into, into more inclusive partnerships. So I congratulate Wider and, and, and Finn, Tony, and the, uh, the team that work on this. And I think it's, it's brilliant that the international community managed to pick these five priorities uh, areas for for Africa, but also that is relevant for other developing countries. So now we have to do research, and, and I think it's a, it's a good area that, uh, to work on. Thanks very much. Just behind. Mathis Venet from University Paris Dauphine. Well, what about financial inclusion in Africa? We know, we all know that many, many African people are excluded from formal uh, financial institutions, such as just have, uh, having a bank account and, and so on. So what do you think about financial inclusion? Is it so important to support the inclusive uh, growth process and so on? Thanks. Okay. Unless there's somebody who really have a really burning question, I will then turn now to the panel. If I may add a personal observation before we go to the panel, uh, there is one issue that is at least sort of being discussed in terms of the high-level panel process, um, and it is a point that I have made, which is that it's interesting when you look to that uh, agreement among these leaders of, of the world is that the only absolute target they could agree on is leave no one behind. I would maybe say that it would be kind of nice if we could push them to put a few more absolute targets for people in the developed world to impose them on ourselves rather than just the leave no one behind, which is obviously going to be most binding on some of the poorest countries. But with that sort of reflection, let me now turn to the panel. Maggie, you want to go first? Um, yeah, so I want to say something to my colleague from Ghana. <laughs> so, you know this, um, I couldn't also clone myself because I wanted to go to the development model, one about Brazil, but I, I also wanted to go to the Malawi session. So I ended up at the Malawi session. But, um, but you know, this uh, thing they were talking about in Ghana isn't exclusive to Ghana. We have it in the United States, too. You, did you see the debates between Romney and Obama? But my friend, you look a little bit young, but why don't you run for president? It's up to you. You <laughs> run on that platform. Why are we always putting each other down? I mean, it's up to... To the, I mean, it all, it's, it's got to be homegrown and it's up to the, to the young. And, uh, and um, about natural resources and structural change, I just want to plug this uh, African Economic Outlook. It's their annual publication. They've been doing it for about 10 years now or five years. Uh, um, but the latest one, 2013, is about structural change and natural resources. And there are some very upbeat messages in there. Um, one of the contributors was Jim Robinson from Harvard, and he talks about um, countries that have industrialized on the back of natural resources and how, how the organization of the natural resource extraction can, can, has a big impact on how inclusive that growth is. So that's it. OK. Uh, OK. Kari? Just uh, one reflection <coughs> on the basis of what Tony said about the importance of, of transparent uh, tax 
administration, and, and that I think relates to one, maybe one research area, which has to do with the so-called political will. Because in some countries, we sometimes need to question whether the country's leaders are really in favor of building transparent institutions which work for the benefit of the people. And if research can throw some more light on those issues, it would be appreciated. Mm -hmm. That's understood. There might be some insight in the forthcoming position paper on fragility and governance, which, which might be of use uh, in this context. And maybe I can encourage Rachel and, and Kari uh, to take a good discussion on that. We will actually, uh, from the wider side, be launching a, a big meeting in, uh, in New York on some of these issues. Ravi, you want it or you feel... Okay, Tony? I think the issue of um, the investment of uh, mineral resource revenues and natural resource revenues is, is really at the, uh, the forefront of the agenda. And, and if we can't find um, domestic opportunities for investing those resources, then economic theory would tell us if the rate of return is higher abroad, then they should go off abroad into some kind of um, sovereign wealth fund. But that isn't going to produce you inclusive growth in Africa. So we need some mechanisms for translating those resource rents through perhaps the banking system, through more investment in agricultural productivity to actually generate that inclusive uh, growth. And that's going to be a really tough job. But my, my final reflection is actually um, Martin uh, Revalian very eloquently started the conference with a sort of 200 review, 200 year review of history, the history of poverty reduction. And my, my reflection without going into 200 years of, of history is that if you look at the history of development in Europe, yes, we achieved enormous growth, an enormous rise in living standards. We achieved along the way poverty reduction. But if you look at that history, it was also an incredibly brutal history. It was a history of civil war, it was a history of wars between states. These are the points that Sabah and Sobu raised. And if you think about, you know, why is it that the United Nations should work on economic issues? Well, clearly, it's obviously to be helping recipient countries, developing countries, to avoid some of that European disaster so that history is not repeated, but it's also to prevent wars between states, which is another founding principle of the United Nations. And wars between states, wars within states, have often economic causes. So I think the challenge for us in the next 50, 100 years is for Africa, yes, to achieve the economic growth, yes, to achieve the higher per capita income, yes, to achieve poverty reduction and inclusive growth but to do it without going down the disastrous route of war and conflict that we've seen historically has been the dimension of European and other countries' history, which now constitute the rich world. And I submit, you know, that's a real challenge for the international system, a real challenge. It's not for nothing that uh, next year is 2014 and the 100th, year, 100th anniversary of the First World War. Okay, thank you, Tony. Gamano? Uh, a comment on uh, an observation on uh, uh, where to invest in, uh, in agriculture. I think we should uh, invest in um, programs that increase uh, food production. So we pay attention to raising productivity in the, in the food sector. But that also has to be accompanied with uh, land reform. Without land reform, it would be very difficult to. Uh, for that investment to be productive. And also a final observation, we know from Asia and uh, China that we can actually overcome our food poverty uh, problem. Without overcoming the food poverty, inclusive growth will, will, will not mean much. Thank you. Thank you, Germano. Uh, I, I would like first to thank the panel for having done a very good job in this final session. So I hope you will join me in thanking the panel for this. And now to a few uh, closing remarks uh, from my side. 
the deliberations, the discussions, and so on from this conference, we will be producing a summary report. It will be made available. So you will be able to sort of flip back and try to recap. We would appreciate when you have that opportunity, let us know if you agree, disagree. Do engage with us. Do sign up to the various possibilities of following what we are doing. There is a website. There is a newsletter. I think if you take a look at that newsletter, you would actually be quite engaged. The chief editor there, Tony, is pretty good at picking out issues that are really interesting and that you can learn from. So sign up. Also, do look for the next conference. Do look for our call for papers. We are trying to engage. We are in the process of preparing our next work program. As I have indicated once or twice, the themes of transformation, inclusion, and sustainability will be core to that work program. In this very moment, I do not know the dimensions of the program. Uh, we are in a process of negotiations with donors. And some of you might be horrified if I mention the different types of scenarios that I have to deal with together with my colleagues. But what I can assure you is that WIDER will continue to be focused on the transformation, inclusion, and sustainability issues independent of the exact dimension of what we are going to be able uh, to do. We will be continuing with the development conferences. For me, it has been actually quite exciting because I do believe that this has been an example of how we as a global network can actually engage with each other and can actually learn from each other. And it has been absolutely great for me to try to absorb, notice, and sort of think about what all this means in relation uh, to our next work program. Thank you very much to all of you for making this event such a great one. I have one sort of uh, thing I would like to strongly appeal to you, which is that you will be receiving shortly uh, a request for giving us some feedback. It is, of course, always very nice to get feedback, but let me add also a very simplistic argument, and that is that if you do not give us that feedback, we won't get the necessary dollars for the next conference. So please, may I, may I sort of um, recommend, may I sort of appeal to you that you do give us that feedback, both when it is nice to hear, but also with constructive criticism, because we actually learn from that feedback. Thank you very much for participating. But before I wish you a safe journey back, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the wider staff who have made this possible. I would like to thank Anna, the conference secretary, working with Mina, late evenings, long days on making this work. I'd like to thank Anna for having worked so much on the poster session. And then I'd like to thank all of the people who have now been here running around with the loudspeakers, making sure that it works, the team that has been videoing, and behind the scenes, all of these things that are absolutely necessary for such an event to proceed in this way. And one of the nice things for me is to say, I do believe that we work as a team, and I'd like to thank you, the wider team, for that effort. Thank you very much. So, now all I have left to say is thank you very much to all of you in your different capacities at this conference, and safe travel back home, and see you next time. Thank you. So.